Okay, welcome everybody to our weekly Outlook webinar. My name is Ilyan Yotov. I am uh, familiar to many of you perhaps as the creator of the quarter steering method. I am the Forex strategist at allthingsforex.com. And uh, I invite you to listen Monday through Friday to my daily Outlook on the currency majors, uh, a popular program that I call the All Things Forex Broadcast. You can listen on allthingsforex.com and also on fx3.com, as well as other major popular financial uh, Forex websites. Um, I would like to uh, thank our friends at fx3.com for putting together these series of webinars. And what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about the upcoming trading week. We'll list the top 10 spotlight economic events, and we'll follow up with the currency majors to see what are the latest trend developments with them and what we can anticipate could be some of the trend development scenarios that could play out in the week ahead. Now, uh, the new trading week ahead of us is going to be a very busy one, and it's going to culminate with uh, the U.S. non-farm payrolls report and employment situation, obviously that's the mother of all important economic data for next week. But before that, every single day of next week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, we're going to have important economic data that is being released out of the United States. So what does that mean? It means that five days in a row, with the culmination, of course, being the non-farm payrolls report on Friday, Traders, in my opinion, are literally going to dissect each and every element of these economic releases. Why would they do that? Because the market now is going to continue to be looking for clues as to whether or not the U.S. economy is improving or if economic conditions are deteriorating. And based on that, based on the upcoming economic data, the market is going to continue to price in expectations as to what the, the next move by the Federal Reserve Board is going to be, especially a few weeks ahead of the Federal Reserve's interest rate announcement and monetary policy meeting, which is scheduled for September 20th, September 21st. The Fed last week announced that they're going to make the one-day meeting, which was scheduled originally for September 20th, now they're going to make it a two-day meeting so that they have more time to discuss the recent economic developments and the future direction of the U.S. monetary policy. Mr. Bernanke, the Fed chairman, came out on uh, Friday of last week in a uh, speech after during the press conference, uh, the um, meeting there in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, and said that the economy has not really deteriorated enough to need immediate quantitative easing on mon or monetary stimulus. So now that's helping risk appetite, as we noticed with the market's reaction in Friday's trading session. But that doesn't mean that if economic conditions continue to deteriorate, and if the Fed continues to see that, that the, the Fed is going to not be forced into offering additional round of quantitative easing, uh, the so-called QE number three. And we know what that would mean, obviously, for the U.S. dollar. Now, in my outlook for FX3, I wrote that uh, another weak or disappointing non-farm payrolls report, especially because that is the weakest spot of the U.S. economy, is the labor market. Things are not improving there. We're not creating enough jobs here in the United States. And uh, I even mentioned that uh, the current level of, uh, of, of job creation, which was dismal in the previous couple of months, we had a little bit better, brighter spot in July with 117,000 jobs. But even in that, at that pace, we cannot even keep up with, uh, barely keeping up with the population growth in the United States. We have to create more than 200,000, 250,000 jobs in order for us to start seeing the unemployment rate starting to come down. Unless we do that, there would not be significant improvement in the U.S. jobs market. So now if the non-farm payrolls report and the data throughout next week from the United States shows us these more and more signs of weakness from the U.S. economy, then we could get closer and closer, one step closer to another round of quantitative easing. And possibly the Fed announcing it as early as their 
meeting, which they made instead of a one-day meeting, now they're going to have a two-day meeting on September 20th, 21st. And that's only a few weeks ahead of us. The first spotlight event that I have chosen for next week is going to be the U.S. Personal Income and Outlets. Now, we have these webinars on a regular basis pretty much every Sunday with a few exceptions here in the last several months. And you should know by now, if you're a regular viewer and a listener of these webinars, you should know what these economic reports mean. And I think that the, one of the benefits of you attending on a regular basis is because this becomes a second nature to a trader. Even if you weren't um, aware of what these economic reports would mean, whether their definition, what is the impact on the market and so forth, what exactly, how exactly we can interpret them, Maybe if you attend these webinars, I hope, you can learn a little bit more each and every Sunday. So those of you who listen regularly would know the personal income and outlays is uh, a measure of the income received and purchases that are made by U.S. consumers, and it comes along with uh, the preferred gauge of inflation by the Federal Reserve, which is the PCE price index, or the Personal Consumption and Expenditures Price Index. This is an inflation indicator which measures a uh, variable basket of goods and services as opposed to the consumer price index, which is the preferred gauge of inflation of other major central banks, which measures a fixed basket of goods and services. So the Federal Reserve here in the United States have a little bit more of a preference to that PCE price index which measures the variable basket of goods and services. That gauge of inflation preferred by the Federal Reserve is expected to show us a slight increase by 0.2% month over month in July compared with 0.1% month over month increase in the previous month. Now, if inflationary pressures increase, obviously the Federal Reserve will be a little more hesitant to consider another round of quantitative easing. Um, and certainly in recent months we have seen that actually happening inflationary pressures have been rising here in the United States. Although they were relatively low to other major economies, um, for example, the United Kingdom economy has very, very high um, inflation rate at 4.5%. The Bank of England's not very high and so forth. Uh, a couple of months ago, it has 4.5% inflation in the UK. The European Central Bank also was not happy when inflation reached 2.8% which is significantly above their 2% target level. And that is why they raised interest rates a couple of times. So obviously that uh, inflation gauge should be watched on Monday. If it increases significantly, that might steer us away from QE number three. If it doesn't, however, if inflationary pressures are somewhat under control, which they are here in the United States, I think, uh, we... Um, the Fed is not going to be impact, the Fed's decision on quantitative easing, another round of quantitative easing, it may not be as impacted by um, the inflation reports. Also, part of the personal consumption expenditures report is going to be the consumer spending, which is forecast to register an increase by 0.5% month over month in July. That's a uh, pretty steady increase. Uh, Actually, it's going to be a nice recovery, if that is the outcome of the report, of course, from the 0.2% month over month, which was the, a decline in June, 0.2% drop in June, and we're expecting an increase of 0.5%. So we might see a little bit of a bright spot with that report on Monday, especially if consumers are spending more. Consumer is a, a big part of the U.S. economy, uh, more than two-thirds of the U.S. economy is services, consumer spending related. That's why it's very, very important for the U.S. economic recovery for the U.S. consumer to keep spending. Now, next week, that's going to start us as far as the sequence of important economic data. And uh, speaking about the U.S. economic data sequence, out of 10 spotlight events, eight of them, are from the United States, eight out of 10. So you can get an idea that it's going to be very, very important to pay attention to each and every economic report throughout next week, especially from the United States, so that we can gauge the economic conditions and ultimately 
find out any clues as to what the Fed's next move might be. Another U.S. economic report is going to follow the PCE uh, report on Monday morning. U.S. pending home sales will be released at 10 a.m. Eastern time tomorrow. And that, of course, is a leading indicator of housing market activity, which, uh, speaking about weak spots in the U.S. economy, labor market and housing market, very closely related, obviously, to each other, are uh, definitely weakest, the weakest spots in the U.S. economy. The pending home sales index would have the potential to also disappoint as uh, consensus forecasts are pointing to 0.8% month-over-month decline in July, following the increase by 2.4% month-over-month in June. So we're expecting new home sales, pending home sales, rather, to drop rather than increase on a month-over-month basis. So that could be another weak economic report from the United States, which could move us closer to QE number three, the need for more stimulus, the need for um, kick-starting the economic recovery once again. Another major spotlight event from the United States, number three for us next week on Tuesday, is going to come with the Consumer Confidence Index. Now, I should not even tell you what uh, anyone who pays attention to financial news, headlines at least, in the last several months would know what's happening. Rising commodity prices, we got um, the whole debacle there with uh, the debt ceiling, we have um, signs of a slowing economy. That obviously has its impact on consumer confidence and consumer sentiment as well. Both of these indexes not doing very well, and uh, on Tuesday morning, we can see the conference board consumer confidence index actually registering a steep decline from uh, 59 and a half in July to uh, 55, a reading of 55 in August. So obviously, another potentially weak economic report from the United States with the consumer confidence. The Consumer Confidence Index is going to be followed by another important U.S. economic report, and that's the Federal Open Market Committee meeting minutes. This is the uh, minutes from the Fed's previous meeting, and I don't think that that is going to tell us a whole lot that we don't already know, but it would be a nice little reminder as to the Fed's view on the current uh, conditions with the economy and uh, remind the markets that the Fed made that commitment to keep rates at the, the record low, practically 0% level until 2013 for a reason, because the economy continues to be very, very weak. Now, the Fed said that there's other tools than quantitative easing to stimulate the economy. Obviously, they can get a little more creative, uh, but uh, some experts are saying they're running out of ammunition. And QE number three is the big focus at, uh, at this point. Now, QE number three, you know, um, causes further debasement of the U.S. dollar. You know how the dollar came under pressure with QE number one and QE number two. What announced, as a matter of fact, exactly about a year ago today is when Mr. Bernanke at uh, the same Jackson Hole, Wyoming uh, meeting had a speech in which a year ago he opened the door to QE number three. And although the Fed did not announce it until November the 3rd of uh, 2010, QE number two was very detrimental to the U.S. dollar. And in the months ahead of the uh, actual QE three announcement by the Fed, which was anywhere between the end of August and uh, beginning of November until November 3rd, many of you perhaps would remember the significant pressure that the U.S. dollar came uh, under in those uh, several months. Could we see the same scenario playing out a year later? It is quite possible. Although Mr. Bernanke last Friday did not um, announce QA number three or open the door wide to QA number three, I think that uh, in upcoming months and weeks, if the economic reports continue to deteriorate, uh, we'll get uh, we'll get there ultimately if that is the case. 
So now let's go ahead and take a look at the um, euro versus the U.S. dollar. And quickly, let, let me quickly mention, after the Federal Open Market Committee meeting minutes, which I think will serve as a, as a reminder of the Fed's concerns about the frustratingly slow recovery, um, we'll see more than likely an echo of the uh, Fed's commitment to keep rates exceptionally low until 2013. Again, nothing new. Nothing that we don't already know, but just a reminder that uh, the Fed is uh, committed to do whatever is necessary to help the economy. On Wednesday morning, we're going to see the main gauge of inflation um, from the Eurozone, and that's the Harmonized Index of Consumer Prices. It's preferred gauge of inflation by the European Central Bank. This is only the preliminary flush estimate for the month of August, uh, but... Um, Consensus forecasts are expecting a reading of 2.5%, which would be pretty much the same as the 2.5% year-over-year reading in July. So no changes in inflation pressures. They're still above the 2% target level of the European Central Bank, but they're not rising in the recent couple of months, obviously, so that is not going to put that much pressure on the European Central Bank to continue hiking interest rates, something that the markets were pricing in Maybe another interest rate by 25 interest rate hike by 25 basis points by the end of 2011. I think that the market's starting to reprice these expectations, and it will continue to reprice these expectations as long as the eurozone economy also continues to slow. Which the signs of a slowdown and weakness are not coming only from the United States; they're also coming from the eurozone. For those of you who have listened to these. Uh, webinars that I do every Sunday, you know that we've been paying close attention to any signs of a slowdown. Now, next week, we're going to see, obviously, with the Eurozone flush, harmonizing this with consumer prices, inflationary pressures remaining steady, according to the forecast. Next Thursday, also, we're expecting the Manufacturing Purchasing Managers Index, which is a leading indicator of manufacturing activity from the Eurozone. Last uh, couple of weeks, we saw the German Economic growth almost uh, almost uh, zero, uh, very minimal in the second quarter, only 0.1 percent quarter over quarter growth in Germany. French uh, economic growth was uh, literally zero percent, so there was non-existent economic growth in France, and that's the second largest economy in the eurozone after Germany. So there are signs of a slowdown, obviously around the world, in on both sides of the Atlantic, in the Eurozone, and also in the United States. So um, the Euro and the U.S. dollar, because of the slowdown in both of the economies and because of the debt crisis on both sides of the Atlantic, in the United States and in the Eurozone, have become sort of like many have called them contestants in uh, a contest, which is uh, to determine which one of these two currencies is less ugly. So the the way that the euro and the U.S. dollar are traded at this point is uh, the market shifting its focus either from the eurozone or uh, back to the U.S. or from the U.S. back on the problems in the eurozone. And each and every week we're going to have to gauge what the market's attention is going to fall upon mainly focusing on the problems in the U.S. and the prospects for QA number three, which puts, obviously, pressure on the U.S. dollar, or back on the problems with, in the Eurozone, uh, Eurozone debt crisis and so forth, which, on the other hand, puts pressure, more pressure on the Euro. Now, the Euro-dollar currency pair, because of these developments, obviously, there aren't very clear trending type of, uh, there isn't a very clear trending type of environment when it comes to the euro dollar exchange rate as the market continues to look for direction. And this is why for the last several months on this program, you would remember we have drawn these lines and we've established that the euro dollar pair for the most part is trading within a clearly established range. And the range Bottom is around the large quarter point, a very important level in my quarters theory, around the dollar and forty cents, with the exception, of course, of that breach below where the euro went as low as dollar thirty-eight thirty-seven, wasn't it? Something like that over here on the twelfth of July. 
it looked like we're going to break below the bottom of that range. And as we noted in the last several weeks, the euro did not break outside below the bottom of the range. It simply continued fluctuating within it. And the top of the range is that double top resistance that was a little bit below a dollar and 47 cents, which the euro dollar pair has not until this day been able to break a bull. Now, on top of that, the new, the new highs have been getting a little bit lower than the top of the range. Here we have the uh, resistance established at $1.4577. A uh, couple of weeks ago, we had another new resistance level below $1.4577 at $1.4536. Then last week, we saw an intraday high or uh, resistance being found at $1.4517. What does that mean? That means that the euro dollar pair has now established what I would call a cluster of resistance levels that are forming a little bit above the large quarter point at the dollar and 45 cents. So the only way the euro dollar pair is going to challenge the top of this range and maybe attempt to break above it and maybe move after that because a break above the top of this range would be a significant bullish technical development. It could really open the door for the euro dollar pair to revisit the yearly high, the high for 2011, which is dollar 49.39. But the only way that's going to happen is the, if the euro breaks out all of these cluster through this cluster of resistance levels. And the most immediate resistance level is the dollar forty-five seventeen, which was the high from August the seventeenth. Shortly above it, we have a high in resistance at the dollar forty-five thirty-six, and just thirty pips above that level, we have dollar forty-five seventy-seven. Now, that's what I mean by a cluster of resistance levels. So the euro is going to need a catalyst in order to propel it high. What could be the main catalyst that helps the euro break above these resistance levels, target the top of this range, and maybe even break above it for a first time in, uh, what, three, four months? QE number three, in my opinion, could be that catalyst. Provided, of course, the market doesn't get really spooked about any kind of new phase of the Eurozone debt crisis begin. Now, um, has the Euro found that catalyst yet? No. Bernanke's speech on Friday did not serve as a catalyst for the Euro to break higher. But the Euro remains well bid at the start of the new trading move. And if we continue to see Weakness in the U.S. economic reports throughout next week and throughout the weeks to come ahead of the September 2021st meeting by the Federal Reserve. The market will continue, in my opinion, to price in for the U.S. dollar weakness on expectations for QA number three, which means, as I explained earlier, further debasement of the U.S. currency. So we'll pay attention to these resistance levels. Think of it as stair steps. In order for you to move higher and move higher in that ladder, you have to overcome all of these different resistance levels, all of these different steps. And uh, depending on whether or not the euro does that, we can gauge what the next move is going to be. Either move to the top of the range, break possibly above it, move to the um, 2011 ties to challenge those, or stay within this current range, where the euro dollar exchange rate has been fluctuating for uh, several months now. So the euro dollar pair is trendless. There is no trend at this point. It is basically fluctuating sideways in a clearly established range, and the beauty of that clearly established range is that we have familiar support resistance levels that we can use as reliable price points of reference, target levels, and so forth. So after the Eurozone flash harmonized index of consumer prices, which is the main gauge of inflation in the Eurozone, we're going to continue the sequence of important U.S. economic data with the ADP employment report. ADP stands for Automatic Data Processing. It's a payroll company, and it has a um, gauge in which it tracks the jobs creation or losses 
in the eye of the storm there in 2007-2008 financial crisis, we actually had losses. The U.S. economy was bleeding jobs, losing jobs rather than creating. So um, the automatic data processing employment report is also sort of like I call it the warm-up to the big event on Friday, which is the non-farm payrolls report. It could be used as a leading indicator of the non-farm payrolls on Friday. It always comes a couple of days before the Friday's non-farm payroll support. Uh, that's why it's used as a leading indicator. And uh, according to the consensus forecast, after adding 114,000 jobs in July, the U.S. private sector, this is only for uh, private sector jobs. It does not include government jobs. The non-farm payrolls includes both private and public sector, which is government and private sector. This is only for the private sector jobs creation. And uh, in July, the ADP employment report showed 114,000 new jobs. The U.S. private sector is forecast to create another 110,000 jobs in the month of August, which is not really that bad. It would be a little bit lesser amount of jobs created compared with July. But if the numbers are worse than expected, that would confirm the Federal Reserve's concerns about the lack of significant improvement in the U.S. labor market. It would mean uh, potentially also negative. That would be a sign of things to come on Friday with a more negative employment report, uh, a non-farm payrolls report on Friday. So obviously the impact is going to be uh, significant uh, of the ADP report if it is disappointing as the market at that point, we'll start pricing in that we might see a disappointing non-farm payroll support as well. Now, uh, on Thursday, I have chosen to switch things up a little bit and um, pick a spotlight event that came, is going to come from Switzerland with the go gross domestic product there. That's the main measure of economic activity and growth in Switzerland. And the Swiss economy is actually doing much better than uh, other economies, the U.S. or the uh, Eurozone economy or the, or the United Kingdom's economy. The Swiss uh, GDP was up by 0.6% according to the preliminary forecast, preliminary estimate for the second quarter of 2011, which is twice as fast of a pace of economic growth on a quarter-over-quarter -quarter basis compared with uh, the first quarter of uh, 2011 when the Swiss economy grew by 0.3% or over 4. The Thursday's report, however, is a revised estimate, revised reading for the Swiss GDP, and it is expected to be revised lower from 0.6% to 0.4% quarter over quarter. Although it will be revised slower, obviously it will be a little bit um, faster than the first quarter economic growth, but it could be, in my opinion, a sign or at least a reminder that the strength of the Swiss franc is um, obviously having it, taking its toll on Swiss economic growth. And you know the Swiss franc frantic buying of Swiss francs uh, until uh, – at least a week or two ago, when the Swiss National Bank announced new measures to curb the strength of their own currency, increasing liquidity and so forth, and maybe even announcing that they'll be willing to consider pegging the Swiss franc exchange rate to the euro. Now, um, so the GDP report on, on uh, Thursday from Switzerland, especially if, shows, if it shows a slower economic growth, could could be a reminder that uh, the Swiss, strong Swiss franc is not helping, and uh, it could mean that the Swiss National Bank would simply continue to be determined to uh, curb any further Swiss franc appreciation. Now, we can take a quick look at the dollar against the Swiss, which is a currency pair that uh, obviously has a very strong, the, the dollar's got very, very strong bearish trend versus the Swiss franc, but here is where the dollar dropped to almost the 0.70 cent, uh, 0.70 uh, level, 70 centimes for one U.S. dollar level 
the law from August the 9th. After that, the Swiss National Bank came in and started announcing these uh, new measures to curb the strength of the Swiss currency. And we saw the dollar rallying, producing a more significant price correction, reaching as high as 0.8157 on uh, what was that on Friday? And it's still lingering now today above the 80 centimes level. But despite of that strengthening here, that still doesn't mean that the negative U.S. dollar trend versus the Swiss franc has been reversed. So obviously at any price levels with, between 80 and 85 centimes or within that 1,000 zip range even, uh, we can see more traders possibly looking for uh, an opportunity or maybe considering to re-enter U.S. dollar short positions in anticipation for the strong bullish Swiss franc trend to continue. But here I have to wave a bit of a red flag and uh, sound the warning bells because, in my opinion, the Swiss National Bank is now very determined because the knife has pretty much gotten to the bone at this point. It's becoming really painful, this frantic buying of Swiss franc and, and incredible strength of the Swiss, and it's really taking its toll on the Swiss economy. So the Swiss National Bank has be become very, very determined, and uh, if there is any future potential for them to, to peg that uh, level of the Swiss versus the euro, uh, the exchange rate, if they um, decide to do that, they must have the arsenal to defend such level. And they also, there were some rumors in a Swiss press that they might choose uh, 1.10 Swiss franc to be the level uh, that will be defended versus the euro. And the euro obviously has bounced versus the Swiss franc as well during this uh, couple of weeks and producing some significant price corrections. So for those traders who think that the, the Swiss franc trend is very strong, I would agree. It's a very strong trend. But be careful because at this point, in my opinion, the Swiss franc has become uh, more of a bear trap, if you will. And what I mean by that is that many traders continue to see this, this strong trend of, of the franc, and these larger price corrections could be considered by such traders as opportunities to reposition themselves at more favorable price levels, but uh, be careful because if the Swiss National Bank continues to be determined and uh, continue to cause further uh, weakening of their own currency, that could become easily a very, very much of a bear trap. So that is something to remember and be careful about going forward when it comes to Swiss franc trades. Um, after the Swiss GDP report on Thursday, we'll see another jobs report from the United States that might not be very, very strong, and that's the weekly jobless claims, which comes every Thursday morning at 8.30 a.m. Eastern Time. It's an important gauge of employment trends and labor market conditions. Many of you who listen to my webinars on a weekly basis know what the magic number is when it comes to the jobless claims. Do you guys remember it? Well, for those of you who are new, let me quickly mention. Oh, the page is up. Okay, let's see. Can you guys see that? See the page? My slide? Okay, good. The magic number when it comes to the U.S. jobless claims, which I've been talking about for months, is 375,000. Economists are estimating that jobless claims must drop to 375,000 or below in order for us to start seeing significant improvement in the U.S. jobs market. Well, in recent weeks, we're definitely away from that level. We're staying above that level. As a matter of fact, we're even staying above 400 now. And uh, although the market is expecting a little bit lesser amount of jobless claims next week, they're expecting jobless claims to reach 409,000 from 417,000, what would really would have to see is a move below 400,000, below 375,000 in order for us to see a significant improvement. That number, if you start watching it from now on, I think will be a very helpful 
leading indicator, if you will, for signs of improvement where ultimately that's going to transpire into the non-farm payrolls and other jobs report numbers that we can see these signs of improvement. Problem is, jobless claims are not there just yet, which only means to me one thing, that we could see further weakness in the U.S. jobs market. And if the U.S. jobs market continues to deteriorate and the U.S. economy continues to falter as far as creating jobs, enough jobs to bring the unemployment rate down, then the Fed will have no other choice but to keep rates exceptionally low and maybe even move closer and closer to QE number three. Now, here's the kicker with the biggest disappointment, I think, for next week. And uh, the market's already expecting these forecast numbers, but I think that this is a report, and that's a number nine spotlight event next week, of course, from the U.S. The U.S. Uh, Institute for Supply Management Manufacturing Index. Now, perhaps a lot of you know that uh, when it comes to these uh, purchasing managers indexes, whether it's from the U.S. or other major economies, the reading of 50 is the dividing line between economic expansion or uh, economic contraction in a particular sector, whether it's manufacturing or services or construction, so forth. If the reading, if the index falls below 50, that indicates a contraction in that sector. Well, the ISM manufacturing index has been holding above 50 pretty much throughout 2011. Now, we approached the 50 level in July with a reading of 50.9, but we still managed to stay above 50. You know, when Bernanke said, well, economic conditions have not deteriorated enough for us to consider quantitative easing on Friday, well, here is an index of manufacturing that could deteriorate enough with a drop below 50 that would start uh, causing more and more concerns when it comes to the Fed's future monetary policies. The consensus forecasts are expecting a reading the uh, U.S. Uh, ISM manufacturing index to drop below 50 next Thursday with a reading as low as 48.5, 48.5. That is a reading below 50, which indicates contraction in the U.S. manufacturing sector which has been the engine of, uh, of the recovery, by the way, manufacturing. If you recall, in the um, second half of 2010 and uh, even the first quarter of 2011, manufacturing has been doing really, really well. Uh, well, not for too long, especially if we start now dropping below 50 when it comes to the PMI index. And then, of course, that is going to lead us to the big event next week, the U.S. non-farm payrolls and employment situation report. That's one of the most important indicators of economic health measures, new job creation or job losses for that matter, in the world's largest economy, which is the U.S. economy. Consensus forecasts are expecting the U.S. economy to add up to 110,000 jobs in August. Some are saying it might be lower than that. The more pessimistic forecasts are expecting 90,000, 80,000 new jobs. Some are even saying we might even see a reading of 50,000. But I, I don't know. Well, I hope it's not that low. Because if it's as low as another month of only 50,000 jobs being created, that obviously could be a very disappointing non-farm payroll support. We have two months of disappointment in May and in June, a bit more of a bright spot in July with 117,000 jobs created in July. Now, if we start heading lower, not higher than 117,000, that would be a major sign of weakness from the U.S. jobs market. And obviously, you know what that means. Now, the unemployment rate is expected to stay unchanged at 9.1%. But as I said earlier, the jobs creation is not enough to bring it any lower. It might keep it steady, 
but we need more than 200,000 jobs to be created on a monthly basis, not create 200,000 jobs this month and then create 30 to 40 or 50,000 jobs for the next two, three, four months. We need constant, strong jobs creation to have that significant improvement in the U.S. labor market. So another weak and disappointing non-farm payrolls report could become the catalyst that could move the Fed closer to QE number three in an effort to speed up the frustratingly slow pace of recovery at the expense of the U.S. dollar. Now, let's go ahead and answer some of your questions. We'll start with John from Canada, whose favorite currency is the Australian dollar. And uh, John is a regular listener, viewer of these webinars. Thank you, John, for the good question. He says, what will be your forecast on the Australian dollar this week? Any critical levels to watch? Thank you, John, for the great question. Let's go ahead and take a look at the Australian dollar versus the US dollar. And John was asking, is there any important levels that I should watch, that we should watch for next week? Yes. The answer is definitely very important levels that you should watch for next week. And uh, let me quickly just delete these lines here so they don't confuse you. Okay, here's the all-time high, a little bit below dollar uh, and eleven cents for the Aussie versus the US dollar. And the levels that you need to watch is this uh, resistance from last week which is dollar zero six zero one. Now the Aussie dollar pair approached it within 10 pips on Friday. We saw it reaching as high as dollar zero five ninety one. And uh, that level here is going to really tell us the story. If the Australian dollar breaks above, and let me move this line, so this is going to be our resistance area. If the Australian dollar breaks above this dollar and six cents level, that would mean that we're going to have um, the door open for the Aussie dollar then to challenge this previous uh, triple top resistance, which is a little bit above an important level in my quarters theory, the large quarter point at the dollar zero seven fifty. And you might recall these resistance levels at dollar zero seven seventy four, dollar zero seven. Uh, what is it here? Let's see. 89, $0.07, $87, $0.07, $86. Remember that triple top resistance area, a little bit below $1.08. A little bit below $1.08, a little bit above the large quarter point at the $0.0750. In other words, with the uh, Australian dollar currently trading at uh, $0.0582, which is below a dollar and six cents level, I think that it's strategically positioned to target that uh, resistance at the dollar zero six zero one and possibly even break it should the economic data throughout next week give us the signs that the Fed uh, could move closer and closer to QE number three. Those of you who pay attention to the way the U.S. dollar were traded, uh, especially against uh, other majors, including the Australian dollar, ahead of the QE number three announcement in November of last year, would probably remember that uh, last year when we had that, that U.S. dollar decline, the Australian dollar was one of the first ones to start strengthening and, and really taking off versus the U.S. dollar. And I think that the Australian dollar could become a good leading indicator again as far as gauging whether or not other currency majors will follow suit and uh, possibly um, strengthen further versus the U.S. dollar. Now, obviously, the Australian dollar trend is, is a strong bullish trend, although here in the last couple of months has, um, well, consolidated for a few months, uh, then moved a little bit higher to recent highs. We had the spook in the markets with the whole uh, risk aversion thing and the Dow dropping five, 600 points in a day uh, for uh, the last uh, several weeks uh, in some days. Definitely does not help with 
many of you would know as a uh, higher yielding Australian uh, Australian dollar is a higher yielding commodity currency. So obviously the Australian dollar could come under pressure in, in periods of strong risk aversion. But if uh, investor sentiment improves, if we get to see the Fed uh, offering further stimulus to the economy, that obviously could improve investor uh, sentiment. It could move the stock markets higher, and it could also help higher yielding currencies, such as the Australian dollar. I'm, I mean, many of you know that the Australian dollar is, uh, has got a tremendous yield advantage, very significant yield advantage over the U.S. dollar. Benchmark interest rate in Australia is 4.75%. It is in a target band between 0 and 0.25%, practically at 0% here in the United States. So the Australian dollar could continue to strengthen versus the U.S. dollar, especially if the market continues to price in the expectations for QA number three. But in order for the Australian dollar to continue to strengthen further, fundamentally we have to see an improvement in investor sentiment. We have to see deterioration in U.S. economic conditions, which moves us closer to QA number three. And also technically, from a technical standpoint, the Australian dollar must next week break out above dollar zero six zero one. And it has to break out decisively, not just by, you know, a few pips. Only then the Australian dollar would move to the large quarter point at the dollar zero seven fifty and then challenge the triple top resistance over here in this area, a little bit below dollar and eight cents. At the dollar zero seven eighty seven eighty nine area, and then if that triple top resistance is taken out or broken above, we could see then the Australian dollar moving to the next major large quarter point, which was uh, also served as the previous uh, resistance level with the previous record high, if you recall, being dollar uh, ten eleven on the ten fifths of an eleven fifths of an overshoot above the major large quarter point at dollar and ten cents. And then if a break occurs above that level, we can retest the new all-time high for the Aussie, which is $1.1079 from uh, July the 27th. But I think the Australian dollar, if it were to do these things, could be a good indicator of uh, further U.S. dollar weakness. And, and even uh, what would be at that point, the revival of the U.S. dollar carry trade. Now, I bet you haven't heard about the revival of the U.S. dollar carry trade in a while now, especially during those couple of weeks here when the equities were dropping and higher yielding currencies such as the Australian dollar came under pressure. If the market sentiment improves and we get to see another QA number three, the Fed has already given us a commitment anyway that they're going to keep rates low until 2013, that's another two years of record low interest rates, another round of quantitative easing, and a further debasement of, uh, of the U.S. dollar, coupled with strengthening in equities, strengthening in commodity prices, improvement in investor sentiment, revival of risk appetite, and we'll have the formula for the revival of the U.S. dollar carry trade during in which the U.S. dollar is being used as the preferred currency for the so-called carry trades or borrowing in countries with uh, low interest rates. Can it get lower than zero? I don't think so. Uh, and then investing in countries like Australia that has, that offers an Australian dollar denominated uh, financial instruments, treasuries, bonds, and so forth that offers bigger bank for the buck, so to say, for investors. So it's important to pay attention to the Australian dollar uh, and the New Zealand dollar, for that matter, another higher yielding commodity currency. I don't really, uh, I mean, obviously, I don't trade gold. Um, let's see here, we have a question. What do you expect on gold? I mean, I I don't really trade gold. Um, my view on gold is that it could continue to, to go up, especially if the U.S. dollar continues to weaken. It's sort of an inverse type of a trade. 
Uh, do I trade it though? Not really. Uh, but there are other ways to take advantage of uh, of the US dollar weakness, especially when it comes to uh, trading it versus other currencies. Well, I think a lot of major currency pairs, to summarize things for this uh, webinar, a lot of major currencies are strategically positioned for uh, possible uh, breakouts or further continuation of, uh, of uh, them uh, moving higher versus the U.S. dollar. And I think the weeks ahead of the Fed's interest rate announcement and uh, monetary policy meeting in September, on September 20th and 21st, will be very crucial weeks. And one of them is next week, especially with the non-farm payrolls report coming up on, uh, on Friday. It usually comes the first Friday of each month, and a lot of experts would agree that uh, the non-farm payrolls often dictate what the market could do for the rest of the, the month, even. So at the beginning of September, on the second day of September, next Friday, depending on the outcome of the uh, non-farm payrolls report, I think it's going to be important to see the clues is what the market could do next and also what the Federal Reserve could decide to do next as far as monetary policy. And mainly, will they announce another round of quantitative easing? Thank you all very much for your participation in the program today. Uh, thank you all for the great questions. We will continue, of course, next Sunday. And uh, in the meantime, uh, if you cannot wait until next Sunday, make sure to join me on a daily basis on allthingsforex.com and listen to my daily All Things Forex broadcast Monday through Friday. Thank you all very much for attending the webinar today. Thank you to our friends at fx3.com. I'm looking forward to seeing you again next Sunday. Have a great week and happy trading.